Welcome to Digging Deeper. I'm Jason Falls. As always, it's good to have you here on the old live stream uh, here on the Digging Deepers on Tuesday mornings. If you are listening to the audio podcast after the live stream show, thank you for subscribing and giving us a little share of your uh, ear this week. We appreciate that. Today on the program, we've got quite a treat for you. Uh, Diana Frank from Retail Voodoo is here with us today. She is the host of of the Gooder podcast, which is a great show that highlights the powerhouse women in the consumer product goods industry. It's a great show to inspire everyone, particularly women, of course, uh, but to achieve success and build leadership in business. Retail Voodoo is a branding agency that focuses on guiding mission-driven consumer brands to attract a broad and passionate fan base. Diana and they have a particular expertise in food and beverage and restaurant marketing. We're going to dig into all of that a little deeper today here on the show. Folks, we've got a lot of different people who watch and listen to Digging Deeper, and many of you are jumping over into the comment section to chime in as we move along today. Appreciate that. Uh, but we have uh, brand side marketers, we have agency types, we have software vendors and other marketing service providers that watch along and listen along. Everyone is certainly welcome here, and we are glad you are one of them. If you happen to be uh, one of those whose company or perhaps clients sells to marketers, then you look for advertising channels that guarantee business marketers are paying attention, right? Well, allow me to introduce you to the Marketing Podcast Network. If you're listening on a podcast, then you're listening to the Marketing Podcast Network right now. MPN is a network of podcasts all about marketing. On Brand with Nick Westergaard, Joseph Jaffe is Not Famous for Immediate Release, Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, and of course, Digging Deeper and many more are there. What that means is 100% of MPN's audience are marketers. Your brand or clients can reach them by advertising on the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more and find our media kit, which you'll see on the screen here in just a moment as we are looking at the site. That media kit can be found at marketingpodcasts.net. That is marketingpodcasts.net. Check that out. We've been, uh, we've been up and running for uh, about three and a half months now. And uh, just this morning, the Marketing Podcast Network signed up show number 21. So not doing too bad of collecting a group of marketing podcasts for all of us to enjoy, listen to, and for those of you who market to marketers to take advantage of. Marketingpodcasts.net is where you find that. Gang, if you are dialing into the live broad broadcast on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter, you can jump in the comments section there or hit at reply on the uh, Twitter video thingy. Uh, and ask questions and interact with us here on the show. Jump in the comments, say hello today, and ask your question, let, making sure that the uh, the plumbing is running over here. I see a couple of little dots bubbling, so it looks like people are going to be chiming in here momentarily. I'll do my best to surface your uh, questions and comments as we go along on the show. All right, that, it's time for me to stop talking and actually get to the reason why everyone's here. Um, uh, so this morning, Diana Freik is the voice behind the amazing podcast, Gooder, the Gooder podcast, in which she interviews some of the most powerful and successful women in the CPG food and beverage industries. She's also one of the partners behind Retail Voodoo, a branding firm that helps drive purposeful brands. And she is with us this morning, live from Seattle, Washington. Diana, good morning. Welcome to Digging Deeper. Hello, Jason. How are you today? I am wonderful. It's good to see you bright and early this morning for you. Thank a little, you. A little later in the morning for me, but uh, yes, I got, I got a lot of questions for you today. So All right. Let me let me start with your focus and passion on working with purpose led brands. If I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken, I understand that that passion for you comes from a few places. One of which is working with Dr. Jane Goodall. Is that is that is that right? Tell me about that. Yeah. So. Um, Oh, gosh, a long time before the Internet. <laughs> it was not quite that long ago. But uh, a few years ago, when I was just a wee pup getting my um, my marketing wings on, I was working for a graphic design firm at the time. And we had by some the work of the agency owners at the time had landed 
Jane Goodall and her foundation as a client. I was a production manager at the time. And so I was responsible for manufacturing, producing, <clears throat> pardon me, the end product of anything that we produced. And we had a, a every, Jane was very explicit about her impact. There's the person that you see on television, on film, same person in real life. In fact, probably a little bit more intense, very much a woman on a mission. And uh, she had spoke with everybody in the entire process of developing all of her materials and her brand. And when it came to me, the person that was physically going to be manufacturing and responsible for manufacturing all of the outputs, she was very clear about where I was to focus my efforts in regards to finding um, paper and manufacturers mm -hmm. that were had an env a positive environmental footprint, were treating their labor properly, um, hundred percent responsible farming practices for those, the trees, um, ev everything that you could think of, everything that's been completely normalized at, at this point, which was just starting to enter. This is 1999, 2000, just to give everybody context. So <laughs> at the time, the Googles as it exists now was nowhere <laughs> near, uh, in existence. And I was staying up 24 hours a day and calling people around the world. And it was all word of mouth. Do you know somebody that who would you recommend? And I was talking to people in countries all over the place, literally asking them questions like, what do you do with your water waste? What do you do? Because I knew if I came back to Jane Goodall, and mm -hmm. I did not have the best solution that was out there, I think she would have had my hide. <laughs> and frankly, that process in and of itself was very eye opening because I found two producers in my weeks of work that were um, 100% environmentally and ethically uh, producing work at like 100% paper paid their paid proper wages disposed of their waste properly, knew their supply chain, um, there was we didn't have the technology to capture half of that. And so even just n people knowing what that looked like. So it was just eye opening. And at that point, then when I moved on into my next career, which was actually selling paper at a commercial level, <laughs> I became in the Northwest one of the primary drivers of environmental, you know, FSC, F SFI, 100% post consumer waste paper products, which was just burgeoning uh, in the marketplace. So uh, yes, she was definitely the fire underneath my drive. Well, as, as gentle as she comes across, I, I can yeah. certainly, uh, you know, sympathize with the fact that I wouldn't want to piss her off. So I, yeah, <laughs> it, that's the thing. I mean, she's very much like, uh, I don't know how you would explain it very much. I would give her a little bit like, um, um, maybe of, of a Mary Poppins, very mm. kind and loving. I mean, you should, you can't, you can't be an unkind person and do the work that she's doing and have care for the planet and have care for the animals and for people in general. But she was maybe focused is the right word. Very much like this is how we're going to do it. And I don't, there are, there's no room for movement here. This yeah. is what my expectations are. And you didn't want to let her down. I think it was yeah. not so much making her upset. You just didn't want to let her down yeah. because you didn't want to be that guy. Yeah, definitely someone who uh, would uh, kind of embodies the the powerful woman, which I know is something you talk about a lot on your on yeah. your podcast. Just not yeah. in the way that you might, you know, sort of, uh, you know, lazily think of a powerful yeah. woman. Just yes. sort of in different ways, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the impressionable years, I guess, of your professional life, you you have these passion led efforts imprinted on you. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what your take on this is. Do you think brands today are um, you know, migrating to or adding on cause and passion related missions for the right reasons. Because when I see companies championing, uh, I can't say the word sustainability <laughs> or social justice or gender equality, yeah. I often step back and ask why they're so vocal about it. Is it mm -hmm. a marketing ploy? Mm -hmm. Is it genuine? Is it a mix of both? And mm -hmm. do I mind if it is? Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, is perfect purpose first marketing just a gimmick or am I just being a little skeptical there? Uh, yes. And uh, I, I don't think it's a bad thing to jump on this bandwagon if it's for 
um, if it's for sales purposes or not, um, simply because sometimes I think you ever hear of this, like if you just start doing something, then after a while, the habit becomes your reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, these guys start to these people or brands start doing things that have some sort of mission, uh, mission based to them in some way, shape or form. And before too long, they are believing it. Yeah. If they weren't believing it before, um, or their company fails because employees leave and, um, and the consumer figures it out because consumers are really smart. Everything's really transparent these days. So, um, in regards to a gimmick, I, I really think that it's not a gimmick. I just think it's going to become an expectation, much like the environment, like the environment, like back in the day in like 2000, in the early 2000s this recycled thing. It's not a thing, you know, who's going to use hundred percent post-consumer grade, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And now at, consumers are like question why you don't do it. Cause it's too yeah. easy. Yeah, that's very true. So I think that maybe some, some of the efforts that are a little bit more aggressive and intense and forward facing, you've got to really own that. You've got to believe it. Otherwise it's going to fall flat. But if everybody's doing a little bit of something, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, uh, the fake it till you make it thing sort of applies for me too. If I see a mm -hmm. company that's doing it and maybe it comes across as a little bit forced, I'm like, you know yeah. what? They're trying, they're doing something. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I'll give them a little bit of leeway. I, don't, <laughs> I mean, I don't want technology companies right. out there championing human rights and then right. outsourcing all their stuff to China. So. That, yeah. So yeah. that's what I mean is that it's gotta be, you, it cannot just be as we like to use the term lipstick on a pig. You cannot just go, <laughs> yes, this, is what we're all about and then somebody and you know pulls the curtain back and it's a shit show like you know it, it there has to be efforts yeah. it can't just be lip service for sure i'm just glad lipstick on a pig isn't a kentucky thing i thought <laughs> i'm glad somebody else says that that's nope, good i nope, like it we use that yeah all right let's let's talk about the podcast uh, yeah. the, the gooder podcast yes, is sir. a really i think insightful piece of work by the way it, it Tell us how the show began. What made you want to start a podcast with that angle of talking about powerful women in, I think, the mostly the food and retail space? Yeah. So the story goes like this. So when we rebranded our firm back in 2011 to um, the uh, to uh, retail voodoo, we decided to focus on actually natural food and beverage space. There were some things that were going on in both in my business partner and my life with family, extended family, where food was becoming a little bit of a problem for health purposes, not like everything from intolerances to other kind of side conditions. And we thought, well, food could be medicine in some way shape or form and we saw this organic movement was getting some traction we wanted to take our expertise working with multinationals like the walmarts and the pepsicos of the world take that expertise and give it well not give it but work with those brands in the natural space to start to normalize and elevate this naturals community now over the last few years naturals and organic and better for you has become it's not a trend anymore it's just part of our lexicon now everybody eats food for a bunch of different reasons and so i think we started to look at the trade show food food science uh, and food technology has certainly driven a lot of the things that make those natural and better for you foods taste better taste similar to the food that we grew up with and that um, that captured the attention of a lot of people um, in technology from an investment standpoint. Mm. They started investing in these new food technologies. Um, better for you started to have a little bit wider boundaries so that um, which I think is great because uh, if you're a person that's eating food and and Cheetos and um, and Mountain Dew are your primary food group, um, switching to kale and kombucha, that's a big shift. So we need to make some subtle changes along the way. Let's start from fried to baked and from baked to this, and then this to this. So I, I like that. But along the way, what started happening is we started bringing in leadership, traditional leadership from the old school CPG community, which looked uh, a lot like um, upper middle class, uh, older 
white cisgender men mm -hmm. and we know that women are the primary owners of the pocketbook especially when we're talking about what comes into our families from a food perspective yep. and i also was noticing that we were seeing some inequality from a food from a from a racial perspective so what was happening is the naturals industry at the time was talking to a white upper middle class cisgender audience mm -hmm. and that meant that we were leaving all of our families of color out of the conversation of living a better, better for you life, eat, bringing better for you foods into, into their homes. And it wasn't sitting well with me. I was like, well, we're teaching people who already know what healthy food is, how to eat healthier. First of all, we're cannibalizing ourselves from a business perspective. There's a bigger audience out there, but secondly, it just wasn't setting right with me. So I sat with it for a couple of years and figuring out, well, I, I could just yell and scream about it, but what good is that going to do? And then I thought, well, what if I just find a way to normalize women leadership? Like, let's just, instead of it just looking like the same group of people talking as SMEs, the subject matter experts in our categories, let's find a channel and a way to interview these other women. And some of them are entrepreneurs and other people uh, sit pretty high up in multinationals and all of these women have a story of why they chose the path that they chose um and so i started podcast and it's been a couple of years now and i'm seeing that what i'm seeing is is um the the people that are listening are listening for the content they're not mm -hmm. necessarily listening listening because it's women it's like oh i want to i want to yeah. hear asha's story oh Kira, my goodness, what she's doing over there at Frito Lay. Yeah, I want to listen to what she's doing. So it's not the fact that there are women, even though that's who I'm interviewing. Sure. I'm also doubling down on the diversity part, not just from um, a race perspective, but we've got um, LGBTQ representation. I'm looking for sisters that have been in the, um, the military because they're underrepresented. Mm -hmm. A lot of single women, um, single mothers, frankly, um, startup entrepreneur are entrepreneurially and do startup businesses. So really trying to bring them in and have that representation, immigrants, people f that were formerly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I, it's just like, let's the diversity needs to represent the population a little bit yeah. more. And so that, that at the end of the day is what I'm trying to do is normalize and elevate the work that these amazing people are doing. That's fantastic. Well, you, yeah. you've got about 75 episodes, I think, or so. Out yeah, there. About, mm -hmm. uh, really impressive business owners, CEOs, women from all walks of life, as mm -hmm. you've been trying to build. I wonder uh, what you've learned from talking to them. Are there common elements of those stories that kind of make those women successful in one way or another? No. And yes, I, they're <laughs> all they're all passionate. Mm -hmm. The women that I've interviewed are all passionate and fearless. But I think those are the two big ones. Now, that doesn't mean that all women in business are like that. These are just the ones that have raised their hand and have agreed to be interviewed. So of the women that I've interviewed, though, what I would say is hard work is an understatement. Mm. Uh, and um, I find that I think the most impressive, the one of the things that reminds <laughs> That just kind of reminds me of the divide between how the United States um, manages their households and how where women play the responsibility in business in the household is an interview that I did with Junia Rocha of Brazi Bites. This is um, she was one of my earlier ones. She comes from Brazil and she said, you know, Americans have a hard time asking for help. There's an expectation that women should be superheroes and are superheroes and mm. they should completely run the household and they should completely, and that hiring help like a nanny or a housekeeper is, um, it's like you've lost something. Like there's right. something that you are not as strong as the next person. And she said, we're going to burn ourselves out doing this, uh, you know, like in other countries, hiring help or having family help you mm -hmm. is completely normal and accepted. It's not odd. And so she said she found it very strange that in the U S we still perpetuate this fallacy that um, 
uh, that women should be the drivers of everything in the household, even if they're in the C-suite, even if they're running a company. So that was probably one of the biggest takeaways that still sits with me in the back of my head as I continue to grow our business. That's a, that's a good one to noodle on. I, mm-hmm. I, I like that, that to think about. So my, my CEO here at, at Cornette, Christy Heiler, uh, who might make a great guest for you, by the way. Oh, okay. She's very, very passionate about encouraging the same type of thing. I think your podcast inspires, and that is to drive more women to leadership positions yeah. and success yeah. for, for, for her, particularly in the advertising business. Yes. Um, but she wrote a, a really passionate piece for media post last year, mm. calling for more women owned agencies. And we're going to actually be talking about that topic a bit more on this show okay. in the coming weeks. But I wonder the 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 uh, the statistics stunned me. Less than one percent of ad agencies show a majority ownership by women. Right. That's that number just astounds me. Yeah. And if if anything, the last two years or so socially have taught many of us that it's high time we do some self reflection and educating and try to figure out why these institutional social constraints are still here and try to tear them down. I know you're doing a big part for that. Certainly commend you for that. Um, and so I wonder if you have uh, a reaction to that number and why is it that there aren't more, at least in the agency world, because that's where we, we, we live and work. Mm-hmm. Uh, why aren't there more women owners? Well, it's, it's a number of, there's a number of factors that go into play here. One of them is that uh, just kind of to follow up what I was just talking about, about women asking for help, they're cu- if uh, if a woman plans to have a family or if a if a couple plans to have a family, there's still a natural expectation that the woman will be the one that's primarily responsible for mm-hmm. all of the family activities. And I think that's just a matter of time that we can that we'll start to see that continue to shift. I think we need to have some really fierce conversations, but it's no surprise that that even including myself at one point in time, I wanted to leave the industry financially, wasn't able to do that. I wanted to leave the industry and be with my children when they were young and knew that if I did that, I'd be sacrificing that those, those years out of the marketplace coming back in. And I was okay Mm -hmm. with that. So there's some challenges that we have. Some of them are possible to overcome and some are not possible to overcome. Uh, meaning if you want to leave the workforce for five to 10 years, it's going to be hard to yeah. grow that, uh, uh, to be able to have those roles. Now that said, we also have some cultural uh, cultural narratives that need to be kind of changed earlier in the pipeline, so to speak. So I think we're having the the conversations in college for sure about what's possible professionally for men and women, because I think men should be absolutely okay with electing to stay home too. We're seeing more of that. There are plenty of men that would rather stay home and be the primary on the home front. And I think we just need to encourage those opportunities as well. But I think those conversations need to be had maybe a little bit earlier. It's always a pipeline issue, right? Like, Mm -hmm. so I, I, we see this a lot. We were talking, I was talking with friends this weekend, watching the football game. And we were talking about the disparity of, um, black coaches, head coaches in the NFL. It's a pipeline issue. Yeah. These people are not having opportunities earlier enough. And it's just like sports. If you don't have enough people playing football in kindergarten, then you're not going to have enough in middle school and high school and college and so on and so forth. So the conversations need to be starting at home a little bit earlier. How? I'm not quite sure. You know, I think it's just normalizing that mom's going to work and this is what moms do and dad's going to uh, be on deck for making dinner and that's okay. And I, I think, I really do think it's a normalization on the home front um, to create the, the, the opportunities for these children as they grow up and become adults and know that they truly do have an option. There's no harm and no foul staying home. Um, and there's no harm and no ha- foul of deciding that you want to have a career and own an agency and regardless of gender. Sure. Well, I, I, I definitely agree with you. There's there's definitely a pipeline issue. And, and I think socially, I think we're 
we're gradually shifting and changing. I think right. we're better off today than we were 10 years ago. Let's yeah, say, agreed. So and so forth. Um, but, but I also think there's some things that we can, that we can do in the, in the interim while we're waiting on the next generation to grow into this. Yeah. Um, and so hopefully we can continue to have those conversations. Well, absolutely. You know, my business partner and I have been working together since 2006 after the great recession, we rebranded ourselves. I formally became his business partner. And just recently he's, um, he is gifting me majority ownership in the agency and he doesn't have to do that. Yeah. The oh. long term wise, there are some business goals where I will be responsible for growing the business in a bigger way mm -hmm. and having him kind of move into different areas of responsibility. And uh, that's but that's a big ask mm -hmm. uh, of somebody. This is his agency. He started it in 93 and here he is going, yeah, I trust that I know what you're going to do with this and we're going to do it together, but we're going to do it a different way. And I'm going to have you drive. That's great. Well, Pretty congratulations cool. to, to you and good for him. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll have to check back in with you frequently to see how things are going. So yeah. Next time we, the house will be on fire. And <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it won't be that bad. Um, I definitely uh, want to follow up after we, you know, talk today and introduce you to Christy because I think you, yeah. you all have a lot more in common than not. And okay, uh, probably ought to be having a conversation whether it has anything to do with a podcast or not. It, okay, it's certainly going to be a great conversation for the team. Okay, so we'll do that. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Diana, tell me, uh, tell where, tell people. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Where where they can find the Gooder podcast, Retail Voodoo, and where yeah. they can find you on the interwebs. Sure. Jason, thank you. So just a recap, Retail Voodoo, we brand development firm. We work with food and beverage brands. Um, we're from Seattle. There and and I say those two things together because CPG and brand development, strategic brand development out of the Northwest is not what you would expect. And it's kind of our secret sauce. Mm. So if you find yourself in Seattle, come and hunt me down. But on the web, you can find us at retail-voodoo.com, R-E-T-A-I-L-V-O-O-D-O-O.com. Podcast is in that same location. You can just look for the Gooder Podcast on one of the sub navs. Uh, the podcast is, of course, on all the major platforms. And the best place to keep track of what I'm up to is on LinkedIn, Diana Freik. There's just one of me. There's also the Gooder <laughs> Podcast and Retail Voodoo out there. We're on the all the platforms as well, but that's where I'm the most active, sharing my nonsense and <laughs> my thoughts. Very good. I have uh, dropped the links to those three primary places, Retail uh, Voodoo, the Gooder Podcast, and uh, Diana Frank on LinkedIn over there in the comment section. We'll make sure those are on the show notes as well. Diana, thank you so much for what you're doing. I, I definitely am going to connect you with Christy soon. Only good things can happen from that. Thank really you, appreciate Jason. you being yeah. here this morning and, and thanks for sharing with us. Of course. Well, thank you for having me, Jason. I really appreciate it. And I thank you for the invite. Well, absolutely glad to have you and we will have you back. I'm sure. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Diana Frank. How about that? Good stuff. Um, lots going on uh, in in the world of retail, in the world of uh, leadership and whatnot with her and with Retail Voodoo. So check them out. Those links are there in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, really quickly, um, I was going to do up you know fancy graphics for all this and stuff too, but I didn't get around to it because you know things are busy. Uh, but I did want to drop you a quick line, and I'll probably make sure that this is on the show next week. Um, I have uh, you know uh, the the honor of being invited this year to speak at Social Media Marketing World, which is a big social media event. I think it's the biggest social media conference in the world these days. It's March 14th through 16th in San Diego. Um, and so you can go there in person. I will be there in person uh, as far as I know, unless something weird happens with, you know, pandemic stuff. Uh, but I will be there in person. I'd love to see you there, but there's all are also virtual tickets. Um, and if you go to the link that I'm about to give you, uh, which I don't have the graphic to throw up for those of you watching, but if you're listening, uh, you can jot this down. If you go to that link, you'll get a little bit of a discount on all those ticket prices. I think the virtual ticket with this link I'm going to give you is almost 50% off. So, uh, do join uh, us virtually, or if you can make it to San Diego, not a bad place to go, right, in March, especially 
uh, if you're in the uh, you know northern uh, parts of the the states or in the Canadians, uh, you can you can get south and get warm. Uh, the link is Jason Online slash SMMW, which is short for Social Media Marketing World. SMMW. I'm going to drop that over in the uh, comment sections. I'll make sure there's a link to that in the show notes as well. You can always find our show notes after the shows at teamcornet.com. Click on the news. Or if you remember the name of the guest, which today it's Diana Freik, and her last name is F-R-Y-C, um, it's cornet.online slash Diana Freik. That'll get you to the show notes. Give me about an hour to get it up. It's not live yet. I can't, I'm not magic. Uh, but once I get it up there, it'll be at uh, cornet.online slash Diana Frank. So you can find it there. Uh, also, don't forget, folks, there are now audio exclusive episodes of the Big Deep, Digging Deeper podcast available only on the audio podcast subscription. Certainly, we do publish the audio from this here live stream, so you can listen on demand if you miss the show. But we've also begun producing and adding some bonus episodes just for the audio listener. So subscribe to the audio podcast by visiting cornet.online slash digging deeper or search for Digging Deeper Cornet wherever you get your podcasts. If you do subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, or anywhere else, jump in there and give us a review, won't you? We prefer five stars, but that's your call. We love the feedback. We'd love to have you uh, jump in and, and do that. Um, uh, uh, also, also, if you want to uh, check out the video archives of the show, you can jump over to the old cornet.online slash dig deep. And that URL gets you to the YouTube page where Digging Deeper is uh, is there on the videos. So you can subscribe there if you want to if you want to look at my ugly mug every week. Thankfully, the guests are always better looking than me, but I'm going to be there. Sorry. All right. uh, Next week. I'm loving it. Ellie Moody from McDonald's will be here. Yes, that McDonald's. She is the digital customer care strategy manager for Mickey D's. We're going to dig into handling social media trolls and dipsticks who just want to bug the hell out of your brand, but also the good fun brands can have by engaging their consumers online with someone who does it for one of the you know largest consumer brands in the world. Ellie Moody from McDonald's will be here next week on Digging Deeper. That is Tuesday, February 22nd, I do believe, uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. If you can, if you cannot be there live, subscribe to our YouTube channel at that address I threw up there a minute ago. Here, I'll throw it up there again. Cornet.online slash dig deep, where you can watch the replays on demand. Or, of course, you can subscribe to the audio feed at cornet.online slash digging deeper. How about that? Good show today, folks, and hopefully uh, I will. we've reached the point in the show where I always point this out. I probably shouldn't point it out, but we've reached the point in the show where I have to hit more buttons than I know how to do with one finger at one time. So I'm probably going to mess something up, although sometimes I pull it off and it works. Let me see. I got one, I got two, and then I think the other one's right here. Let's try this. That'll do it for this edition of Digging Deeper. If you like the episode, share it with a friend or colleague who might as well. Digging Deeper is a production of the Cornet Group. Find us online at teamcornet.com. Our executive producer is Christy Heiler. Creative director is Jason Majeski. Associate producer is Ashley Harris. Our theme music is composed by Rex Banner. I'm your host, Jason Falls. Until next time, I'll see you on the interwebs. <laughs>